would be uh, uh, ketan has uh, muted most all of you and uh, any of you who wish to uh, uh, part uh, who wish to speak out during the presentation or uh, you can just unmute the uh, you can uh, raise your hand and ketan will unmute it uh, uh, the panelists will stay unmuted uh, they can mute themselves if they want to uh, and whenever they want to uh, uh, in interact in during my presentation any uh, any of the your free free to uh, just unmute yourself and talk right so again once again i thank you all for uh, joining us today and uh, yeah so this is actually a very uh, critical time for the bond markets and especially with a budget going ahead uh, on the on monday so what are we expecting in the budget clearly i think uh, the government is saying um, about the fiscal front of it uh, uh ketan can you just go on to the first slide yes. um so the government is clearly uh, talking about the fiscal front and uh, then uh, you have um uh the uh, you would we are expecting a deficit of around 7% uh, this year and if you take states you have 14% of gdp then uh, going into next year uh, what do we expect so we we would expect a very large net borrowing and uh, that is bringing a huge challenges to the government and the rbi so what could be the kind of net borrowing that you can expect is uh, just to give you some numbers we have a nominal gdp of, of close to about 200000 crores and it's expected to go by 15% so even if you take about uh, 5 to 6% of fiscal deficit Uh, if the government is able to show that, and if, even if it's funded by about sixty to seventy percent uh, through market borrowings, then uh, you're looking at a minimum uh, net borrowing of seven lakh crores. Now that's a huge amount for the market to absorb. Uh, so we would have to see how this whole thing is going to go forward because without the RBI, the government cannot absorb the uh, the market cannot absorb the uh, uh, borrowing. and if the, with the if the rbi starts to interject huge amounts of money through uh, omos purchases then that is highly inflationary in nature and uh, you must have, all of you must have noticed in the last few bond auctions uh, the market appetite has been very very low and uh, all of you must have been reading our uh, analysis on the markets as well and we have been putting out the fact that trading volumes have dropped substantially and rbi has now become the market rather than allowing the market to function on its own and so that is keeping the yield curve where it is right so what is happening is um, you have the government bond yield curve the 10 year has been in a very tight range of 580 to 6% over the last many months and uh, it's just not been allowed to move anywhere uh, and uh, uh, given that now clearly the market wants to go short but the rbi is not allowing them so the challenge here would be that will can the rbi actually uh, be able to manage the government borrowing without uh, raising inflationary expectations i think it's going to be very difficult because the budget itself will be inflationary in nature and how it is inflationary in nature is very clearly the fact that uh, uh, very clearly the fact that uh, it's going to be a, a spend driven budget largely on consumption spending not infrastructure because right now the government wants to pump in money especially into the agriculture uh, rural areas and uh, if you notice the few past uh, results of the third uh, third quarter results of which is just coming out from many consumer companies etc uh, even two wheelers and everyone's talking about uh, robust rural demand but at the same time everyone is talking about uh, cost pressures largely because of rise in commodity prices and all of you must have also seen that commodity prices have risen globally uh, and even if you take a look at the commodity stocks here they've gone up sharply so all that tells you that inflation pressure is not going away anywhere soon so the question is uh, if the rbi has a 4% inflation target and if they have to start uh, funding the government then how will they manage both uh, so clearly i think this is the biggest challenge and the very fact that the rates are itself are extremely low so we have uh, 4% repo three quarter reverse repo most of the short end papers is trading below 4% uh, we have seen a bit of a tick 
we have seen some resistance actually, especially in the tax-free bond space, the yields are starting to rise because uh, nobody wants to buy the bonds at these levels. Uh, we have seen a few uh, short-end papers moving up. Uh, then you have seen the kind of pressures that the market is putting on the RBI on the longer end of the curve. Uh, so with all this, I think the big, this is the biggest challenge. And then you have uh, obviously the global part of it where the Fed has clearly said that till 23, they'll keep rates at uh, 0% and uh, that they will um, uh, uh, they will continue to pump in liquidity uh, through bond purchases. Uh, so all that is actually adding pressure on the global liquidity front. So this year has one of the been the most uh, uh, positive years for equity inflows. Uh, we have seen uh, almost a humongous amount of inflows coming in. And uh, I think December was the highest ever seen on record in terms of flows. Uh, so that RBI has a challenge in managing that as well. And if you see their FX purchases this year, they have, uh, you know, on a cumulative basis, they have crossed about uh, almost uh, $60 billion, uh, close to over 5 trillion uh, rupees of uh, and additional liquidity infusion. Uh, so how are they going to start sterilizing this? So there are a lot of challenges for both the RBI, the government and the market here. Because once RBI starts to tighten liquidity, the short end is going to start moving up sharply uh, in anticipation of rate hikes. And uh, the long end will continue to be pressured by the government uh, because of a heavy supply. Uh, so with these two, and inflation has continued to keep knocking on doors. And uh, so with all this, I think the, the challenges for both policymakers, issuers, investors is pretty high this year, right? Uh, so with this, um, uh, uh, but having said that, now uh, every challenge has an opportunity, right? So in this market, uh, there are opportunities. So if 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 the economy actually grows, then uh, the need for issue borrowing will be much higher, especially for investment side purposes, and that could uh, raise the total market size itself, as well as raise the number of uh, kind of structures that are coming on, the act, number of issuers that are coming on. Um, and then uh, you obviously have when the economy grows that you know balance sheet starts to improve and when balance sheet starts to improve then you find higher yield bonds that are trading at attractive spreads uh, they could look to you know give you uh, that extra kind of gains and there are other opportunities as well as and go along as you come right uh, Ketan can you just move on to the next few slides Right, so you have, uh, like I mentioned, so in, what are the main challenges for investors in the market? Uh, investors uh, have the challenge of, uh, if they invest now, they're getting the lowest yields possible. And they many, uh, and the, uh, if rates rise, that means they know that the, the current investments are not, uh, will uh, at least even, even if they're planning to hold it to maturity, but they will have a mark to market loss. So, um, so that is one clear challenge here. So where to invest? So at the short end of the curve, you get nothing because inflation is at 7% and uh, uh, yields are at 4 to 5%. At the long end, you have faced the risk of in, in, uh, rising interest rates. So what is the, uh, what is the, the uh, what, so what is the investments you need to make for investors? Uh, so this is a big challenge. I mean, this is some questions which have been asked uh, almost every day and then you also see that um, you also see that many investors start to take extra risks without knowing what they are getting into so they go into higher yielding credits they're going into higher uh, uh, higher risk papers um, just because they see higher yields and uh, so without understanding what they're getting into now that's a big risk they're taking uh, and which is uh, to some extent because the fact that uh, the yields are so low that any returns which actually promise some kind of a safety they're looking at. Equity markets are greatly volatile, obviously. Um, so in that sense, people who are investing in fixed income are uh, under huge pressure at this point of time. Now, what are the challenge for issuers? So issuers obviously are facing the biggest challenge here is uh, one, uh, one is the fact that um, the government is continuously issuing at the long end of the curve. 
So that is keeping spreads at the longer end higher than at the shorter end. But you can't continually in, in uh, issue at the short end because then you face re, uh, you face reissue risk, right? Uh, so when they, then you have an asset liability mismatch. And uh, at this point of time, uh, there is a huge amount of risk management going on uh, across the issuer space, especially in NDFCs. Uh, nobody wants to have a large asset liability mismatch. Uh, and that, so they they would have to manage the borrowings very carefully. So what the uh, so while yields are very attractive and they can continuously uh, fund their existing uh, loans against uh, lower uh, yielding bonds or papers, the problem will come when it comes up for uh, maturity and would they have the liquidity at that point of time? So nobody would want to do that uh, continuously uh, issuing bonds at the long end, short end of the curve to fund longer. Uh, dated uh, loans. Uh, so in that, but having going to the longer end, uh, they may they find that the market is not very liquid, uh, and also the fact that it is uh, the spreads are much higher there. So issuers have a problem, and then you obviously have the debt market participants who have a big problem. Where one is obviously the advisor community, uh, where uh, to, uh, who are who is advising their investors, clients on where to invest in fixed income. Uh, again, the same problem. Uh, the short end is very low. The long end is uh, sounds risky. So where do they invest? Uh, should should they invest in high yields? But then they invest in high yields. What is the extra risk they're willing to take on that investment? Then you have the arranger community in talking to issuers and how to uh, you know um, uh, how to uh, how to get the how how to uh, widen the uh, uh, investor base for the issuers and uh, 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 get bonds issued across the yield curve rather than just at the short end where the demand is high but then it could vanish suddenly and uh, uh, and then the whole other uh, host of uh, uh, market participants including our debt market brokers and everybody else uh, seeing um, uh, very difficult conditions even though the rates are so attractive uh, at low levels. And uh, if rates do tend to rise, then uh, typically when rates tend to rise, the volumes start to shrink. So that's also a big problem for everyone here. So these are the biggest challenges for the, um, uh, for, the for issuers, investors, issuers, and debt market participants. Um, okay, then we can, can we go to the next slide. Yeah, so these are just some charts uh, showing the uh, Yields, yield curves, you can scroll. Uh, so even the SDLs have come down, the AAA rated bond spreads have come down. So we address this high inflation and fiscal deficit, which is now hurting the debt, hurting the debt market. And um, uh, uh, especially now with the budget coming up, we don't know where the kind, what kind of net borrowing will come. And uh, if you look at uh, the sound bites coming in from the uh, com uh, from the institutional community, there is a lot of resistance uh, to the bonds at these levels. Uh, so, like I said, I mean, inflation while it printed lower last month, and if you look at it, the government is also very is being very optimistic. If you see the economic survey. They are saying real GDP at around 11% and then uh, nominal at 15%. So they're looking at a GDP deflator of around 4%. Looks very, very low to me, uh, especially with rising commodity prices and with the fact that the government is budget will be inflationary. So um, in this sense, I think that there is some kind of a disconnect there. The markets, bond markets obviously will go on the wrong side of the whole thing and uh, they will continue to be uh, very, very wary of where inflationary pressures are heading. We still haven't seen a pressure on the currency because current, the rupee has been do, doing very well in the last um, uh, year, uh, especially with the dollars uh, on a continual uh, weakening path and with huge amount of flows. But uh, having said that, uh, we know that the uh, portfolio flows can be extremely volatile. They could be highly temporary in nature and if they see any risk to the country in terms of high fiscal deficit, high inflation, hurting, and the lack of growth, then the money could go out as fast as they come in. 
and that's going to be a challenge. Uh, so the biggest uh, uh, risk I see is, and I've been putting out continuously over the last many years, is many months, is that RBI has to start. Uh, RBI is looking the other way. Uh, they are um, they're continually, uh, you know, supporting the yield curve. Uh, whereas what I what we think, uh, what I think they should be doing is that they sh if they want to support the government borrowing they can uh, they can buy government bonds in the secondary market and let the market decide the yields whereas here they are trying to support a yield curve at artificially low levels and this hurts the whole community as well it hurts issuers it hurts investors it hurts the market participants right can we go to the next slide uh, Kitan? just just an inflation figure um, like I mentioned about excess global liquidity at the central global central banks, uh, that's going to continue and it's not going to stop. Um, we can go to the next slide. Yes, so this is what I meant. RBI managing the yield curve uh, to protect bond deals. Uh, this I see is the biggest risk uh, for the market. Uh, like Sriram put it there, when I spoke to him last, he was saying it's a moral hazard and I completely believe it is a moral hazard. Um, yeah, we can go to the next slide. So where are the opportunities here? Uh, now, the biggest opportunity I see is the bond market growing multifold. So in all this debt uh, issuance, uh, what typically tends to happen is uh, that uh, uh, as the supply increases, there are more and more ways to find increase the market debt. Uh, so, in the sense, what we have seen here is the government bond supply is going to stay high and it's going to uh, stay high going forward for many years. Uh, we also see uh, the economic growth coming in and also the fact that there is more encouragement by the policy makers, especially in the government and the RBI to go to make uh, borrowers issue the uh, bond market rather than go to bank for loans. You know, now uh, they have made it compulsory for at least uh, the large corporates to go to the market for uh, for uh, uh, for uh, uh, part of their uh, for part of their loans, and uh, I think this should uh, this will continue going forward, and there is a huge uh, uh, move towards de-risking banks' balance sheets, especially the PSU banks, and uh, so the and the banks have traditionally been. Um, uh, lenders of, you know, they, they, they lend across the yield curves, right, from working capital to the project finance levels. So now uh, they, what, what would happen typically is maybe the, uh, the corporates will go to the bank for working capital requirements if required, if it's cheaper than the market. Uh, else they will have to access the bond market for any kind of, a, uh, any kind of uh, uh, funding that is required for a longer term in nature. And this could now start with more uh, different structures because obviously uh, they would have to cater to market appetite at that point of time. Uh, they, it could also lead to more kind of um, uh, products that can come in uh, with uh, a lot of innovation as well. And, uh, and I, I also believe that as the market grows, uh, you also have uh, technological in, in innovation, uh, digitization, etc. Uh, so all this is very big opportunity. And uh, this will also make uh, this will apart from the institutional side of the business, this can also make it um, uh, make it a very vibrant uh, retail market non institutional market. So retail here means I means across the individual family offices or even a very uh, retail investor uh, to have access to corporate bonds. Uh, so as then it, it will widen the whole market it's, itself. And I completely believe in the next uh, 10 years, we are going to see a, a completely different market from where we are now. Um, and uh, I think, um, and that itself will bring a great amount of opportunities for both, uh, for, all the, uh, for all the stakeholders, which includes issuers, which includes investors as well, obviously, and includes uh, the debt market participants. Uh, but obviously, I mean, it's not going to be a straight line uh, the way it moves because 21 is going to be a challenging year, um, but uh, if you if if you are going to use 21 this year correctly, 
yeah, properly in terms of positioning yourself, uh, even at the investor level going forward, then I think the returns can be extremely lucrative. Um, the next one, Ketan. Yes, so the non-institutional market is where we see the highest growth coming in. And um, uh, if we also have seen a very, especially in the last few years, we have seen a very uh, uh, very sharp move, uh, very sharp uh, rise in the number of non-institutional investors in, into debt markets. Uh, at Rishi, uh, when I uh, would be able to substantiate that, uh, I'll just finish the presentation and I'll ask him the, uh, what he sees of this. But uh, we are also seeing that uh, now what is happening is the non-institutional investors are actually uh, having their own say. Now, yeah, so to some extent, I mean, I would say that uh, we, uh, we have an angry birds of sort here, uh, clearly because there has been... Um, uh, uh, if you should all, all been following the Angry Bird story, the uh, the whole uh, Robin Hood community and uh, Reddit community is going against the institutional investors. Uh, here, uh, maybe it's not against the institutional investors, but it's against the fact that uh, they are uh, highly under-owned uh, bonds indirectly. So if you just look at it in terms of corporate bond outstanding um, for, for GDP, we are less than 15%, whereas in a place like US, it's around 150%. So the kind of scope to grow is very, very high. And this will largely come when uh, the re uh, in non institutional investors actually start to invest in the bonds directly. Uh, so this market, uh, and we have also seen that in the recent past, in the last few months, when institutional investors shunned papers like uh, Sriram Transport, um, maybe some per perpetual bonds, et cetera the non-institutional investors uh, singularly drove the spreads down, the EZ spreads down, because they were able to see uh, maybe judge risk better. I would, I'm not saying uh, anything on that in terms of, uh, but they have been able to take better calls on uh, maybe the risk appetite is better. And they have been able to say that, uh, you know, we believe that uh, uh, these papers are good, if, even if the fund managers don't believe. So this is a very clear trend, I mean, that is driving down yields. So this is also very uh, eye-opener for the issuers itself, because now uh, typically we have seen issuers going to private placement routes and other things. Now, um, uh, now with this kind of a segment opening up for issuers, then you could have a very strong move towards uh, issuing bonds for a non-institutional segment as well which could actually support much better structures than the institutional segment itself. Um, yeah, so these are all very strong opportunities. Uh, but have, let me just come to, uh, for investors itself in 21, I mean, what are the kind of opportunities they need to look? Um, Ketan, can you go to the next one? Yeah, so where to invest today is the most challenging question uh, I can, uh, I, I, uh, I have to answer and um, I can, uh, I mean, I, uh, peop uh, and people have, to, investors have to answer themselves and for advisors to answer and anybody to answer. Because like I mentioned, uh, um, investing at the short end gains, gets nothing. Investing at the long end gets only in high interest rate risk. And if you go up the credit curve, the credit risk, then uh, if the economy is not doing as well as it sounds, then uh, you could have the credit risk actually rising rather than falling. So where do we look at it? So I think there's there are a little bit of work involved in this. You can always uh, you can always one is to ladder your positions so that um, you invest at the short end, uh, take in some kind of a pain, uh, or you find some bonds that are at the short end that are reasonably priced, and then just wait for. Uh, the rates to move up and reinvest if the reinvest when rates move up it could be one year or two years and then you can actually uh, lock into higher yields so that's one way to protect your capital plus uh, gain extra returns going forward you could also look at structures um, uh, you could also look at bonds that are uh, mispriced maybe uh, we did see like i said uh, the uh, in non-institutional segment taking down um, uh, yields 
then you 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 do have uh, bonds that are you know slightly off the radar uh, off the normal plature but uh, normal um, uh, uh, what is it called not, not of the not the plain vanilla bonds but a little more uh, sophisticated in terms of understanding but if you could understand such bonds um, and uh, uh, and at the, at the end of the day you know where to get where you will get your money from then uh, these bonds can give you some uh, extra returns uh, even in today's market even when rates rise you can still protect your self against rate rise, rate rise because typically such bonds will be interest rate insensitive now i have deliberately not uh, mentioned bonds here because this is not something we want to talk about uh, individual bonds in this forum today uh, obviously inr bonds is uh, doing a lot of research we are putting out a lot of information on our platform uh, we have our own proprietary credit risk score uh, credit spread score rating that is uh, the rating agnostic that is it doesn't really matter on uh, whether the bond is rated triple a or triple b we look at the bond in its perspective of uh, various models that we do and then uh, we uh, we put out a risk score you can take a look at the risk score and then look to invest also you can access our order book uh, where where market participants um, have uh, shown offers there are bids on our order book by my, by uh, investors um, then uh, so with all that you can see a whole host of bonds that are there and then you can come to your own conclusion on which bond to select we are also working on a uh, little more analytics in terms of how to present bonds that could be attractive etc uh, that's but uh, that's i mean as we go along all that will be available to you so this is the main uh, thing that we uh, look at uh, as an for the investors to invest at this point of time then you have things like floating rate bonds uh, which i think if you had read our note on the pfc issuance we had recommended the 10 year benchmark floating rate bond Uh, which we thought was at eighty-five basis points spread for the retail investor was pretty okay. Uh, uh, so similarly, if more issuers come out with floating rate bonds, uh, then those could be used because when the rates tend to rise, floating rate bonds uh, rise as well. Uh, we don't. Uh, the unfortunately, the government uh, came out with inflation index bonds. Uh, they had a bad experience, uh, the investors, uh, because at that time. they came out inflation was falling sharply um, and uh, uh, yields are pretty high as well but uh, but they i think the government should start to reinsure re uh, reissue inflation index bonds at this point of time because uh, inflation expectations can tend to rise and with these kinds of yields i think they can provide a very good um, opportunity for investors to take advantage of rising inflation expectations going forward uh, so clearly i mean one thing about inflation is that uh, globally everybody wants inflation the us fed wants 3% inflation the ecb wants 2% um, so whatever happens uh, they will continue to want to try and achieve that inflation target so that makes it maybe an inflation play at, the, at least in terms of a steep or yield curve uh, which is which has already happened in the us and it can actually continue to uh, steepen as we go along right uh, so with this i think uh, i will um, i will stop my presentation uh, and i'll 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 uh, throw it open to the panelists so let me start with uh, rishi first uh, rishi i've been talking hi yes hi rishi i've been talking a lot about the opportunities uh, right. especially um, across the space and especially the fact that uh on the non institutional side uh i would like to have your opinion on that uh, right so uh, arjun uh, you know this entire non institutional or you can call it retail family office etc has started uh, largely in my view uh, once uh, everyone saw that uh, there is some volatility uh there is a need for a fixed uh, uh return lower risk and uh, with some issues with uh, you know mutual funds and the kind of papers they buy and the lower returns i think uh, 
and of course uh, intermediaries and platforms like us coming up and uh, uh, you know showcasing opportunities that uh, until now weren't present uh, this segment has grown rapidly as an experiment in uh, 2019 we just uh, uh, started uh, you know offering certain bonds that we held in our portfolio to uh, some of the uh, hnis who we knew clients of ours etc and uh, what we realized is that uh, you know there is uh, you know great acceptance uh, on on that front uh, subsequently we expanded it and i think uh, uh, it's really during covid we realized uh, how large that uh, market is uh, i mean some competitors were uh, sort of dabbling in uh, you know that market but uh, you know what i think is the real differentiation here for uh, 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 anyone on the retail side is what they end up buying because uh, you know yield is not as important uh, because of the lower quantities that these guys uh, would end up buying you would see that there is uh, you know great illiquidity and uh, some of the papers that are out there none of the intermediaries would want to buy them unless there is a significant uh, difference in pricing so uh, i think uh, you know the identification and dissemination of information uh, on some of these bonds is uh, extremely extremely important uh, so i think uh, plat- platforms like uh, inr bonds i think uh, you all are doing a great job uh, uh, of actually dissemination uh, disseminating a lot of information which uh, you know the retail investor really needs to make some informed decision uh, because uh, we've also seen instances of uh, mis selling to bonds i think uh, non deliberate where intermediaries themselves didn't have any idea what the term sheet of the bonds actually said so as a, a sort of uh, sap at our end we are very very clear on what we sell why we sell and uh, you know what kind of risk the bond entails and uh, that's one of the reasons why we have lower volumes but uh, you know i don't want to uh, get up to calls from an from an hni or an individual that you know i didn't know about this information so i think uh, the platform of pro- approach is uh, the best in terms of uh, you know dissemination and uh, the identification of risk so the credit score that you have is very important for that we have something like that but it's not a formal uh, uh, sort of credit score that is uh, put out on on everything so but i think this market is uh, huge uh, it's bound to grow uh, in leaps and bounds and in the next i i wouldn't even say 10 years i would say in the next 5 years you could easily see like you know a 5x kind of uh, growth in volumes for this market and that would be driven largely because of uh, lower rates uh, on bank fds and uh, you know equities at this level no one really wants to get into it with incremental cash flow but i think uh, just uh, you know like a stable return kind of uh, scenario right now i think this should be some good news for raji uh, raji right. uh, as an issuer um, uh, very large issuer uh, and what would be the what would you see as the la- biggest challenge at this point of time and uh, where would you see yourself actually going to start which part of the market you going to start accessing going forward yeah i think now, uh i think it's uh, all about timing now um, everybody knows that uh, liquidity has been um, unprecedentedly high for a very long time the repo rates have been uh, uh, the best in the last 20 years i mean we have seen repo rates at 14 and a half percent and now we are looking at uh, you know four percent rates like never before obviously this is not going to last forever everybody knows that post pandemic the liquidity surge that happened in the market was for uh, solid reasons and uh, that rbi has already started uh, corrective action you know in, in january we saw this uh, variable rate variable reverse repo rate they're trying to add daughter end uh, 
um frankly speaking we were riding a wonderful wave as an nbfc issuer we um rode this wave uh, very happily for the last few months and benefited from this and uh, now it's the question of um, uh, stopping and saying you know as you said we have two hats to wear i would say three hats one is the borrowing cost itself which we have uh, we have ridden the wave um, and we have to watch for the timing um, of the uh, timing of when that inflection inflection point will come when we uh, uh, when the rates start hardening across the curve the other is um, uh, you know the other hat i would say the second hat is the alm as you also said in your presentation um, especially after the IL, ilf is debacle that um, there's a lot of um, there are a lot of people watching the nbfcs um, you know on how they are managing their alm uh, we at chola have always had a conservative policy and this uh, is our policy uh, we don't um, uh, go uh, we don't use any plus or minus Uh, kind of thing to swerve from our policy so the alm is an extremely important thing for uh, companies like chola where you know um, it is important to match it and not run a big risk on the book so alm is um, something that you know see again in in alm um, that second hat uh, while the borrowing cost we are waiting for the timing the alm we know there's no there's no one size fits all you can't say that so for example if i toss a question at you uh if i say that uh, you know uh, 25% of my borrowing is cp uh, would that raise an alarm uh, probably uh, 10 years back uh, it would have been jarring you know that you have 25% as cp but today i don't think um, that's an alarming number there are companies like bajaj which have even 60% unsecured in their books so what is the mix uh, so why they are doing it is because for their asset liability that won't work for a company like chola for instance so as an issuer i feel that each uh, each of the issuers has to look at their balance sheet and see what is the mix uh, in terms of uh, instrument tenor and uh, go carefully there um, and uh, you know typically for an nbfc the tenor of our asset book is 2 to 3 years so um, you know uh, elongating the borrowings is what we start need to doing because our liability book is short and um, uh, rightly so for the right reasons now we know that it's going to be you know, hardening we are looking at uh, you know 3 3 over 3 year papers but as you rightly said there is uh, not much of depth in that market um, uh, uh, you know 3 years investors are also waiting and watching uh, so there is no depth and there's a lot of uh, interest in the short term because of from the investors for the reasons that they also want to wait and watch this is a period where you know it's like no man's land we really don't know which way it's going everyone certain it's going to Uh, hardened, but nobody knows really when. And uh, so this is a difficult period for us for issuers. Also, in terms of innovative products, um, uh, there is not much uh, scope uh, right now. Uh, you know, to do, uh, we just want to uh, shift our mix from banking, uh, banking products to market borrowings. That is quite clear. But in terms of innovative offerings, um, we ourselves are uh, wondering what could be the kind of product that would interest investors in the three over three to. Three to five year uh, kind of tenor, and then the third hat, of course, as you rightly said, is the investments. Uh, see, actually, companies like us, uh, like IT companies, you know, which have a cash burn ratio, you know, we also as a finance company like to park some funds uh, to meet our liquidity um, risk, and now it has been mandated by RBI also. So you know, if you look at it in terms of um, uh, investments. Um, uh, you know government securities are uh, quite an attractive avenue um, if you look at the last uh, 10 years you know if you see the five year gsec and 10 years gsec you will find that only in uh, maybe 2011 and 2012 you would have seen a situation where the bank rates were higher than gsec most of the time the gsecs have been hovering higher than uh, state bank of india fd rates so the same tenor so we are happy to invest in gsec and hold it till maturity as long as our stated policy is to hold it till maturity and we choose instruments which have the right kind of liquidity and depth i think we gain so um, you know, that's what we are doing uh, like most nbfcs and uh, uh, so so net net um, uh, there's no haircut also on jsex holding so uh, we are uh, uh, our investments is pretty straightforward in that sense we're going for uh, instruments with depth we are going for holding to maturity and um, 
so our position is secure there uh, yeah so uh, again in now uh, we are um, uh, at a juncture where we are waiting uh, the government is going to have a high borrowing plan we know that uh, it's also the other aspect is oil oil prices uh, you know 10 uh, 10 uh, uh, increase can have a 34 basis point uh, effect on inflation and uh, uh, you know we are uh, watching inflation uh, so and the policy is also due on uh, february 1st so there is um, uh, there is a lot of uh, you know the, the wait and watch is there but i certainly want to say one thing i was listening with uh, great interest uh, rishi was saying and uh, what you were saying about retail investors stepping into this uh, i really wish that happened better knowledge in the market for retail uh, investors you know the irrational exuberance that is there in the stock market uh, you know we don't want robin hoods here <laughs> i mean uh, this game stock i i'm sure uh, most of the audience would have uh, watched with interest this uh, game stock is a stock which was uh, written up by hedge funds they went short on it big time and the robin hoods uh, in their social media and robin hoods came and uh, completely uh, up- upended their strategy and we know what happened it was a big debacle and uh, nothing of a script became a uh, darling of the market is 25 billion dollar cap market cap um, that is not what we want to see here certainly issues like us will be terrified if such things happen and we are happy rbi is there to you know be the uh, father figure here but uh, as again as you said um, rbi is saying playing i think uh, sri ram adhavan also shared with you offline you said rbi is um, playing too much of a role here and uh, so uh, you know holding the rate of person for this long is um, something that's not very healthy and you know, somewhere we should be given the elbow room to start acting not waiting and watching all the time yeah. even given the uh, covid times so net net uh, that's what it is and um, as issuers we are very very happy to be in the market at the longer tenor and uh, we want market participants and uh, 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 like yours you know to enhance the learning from the industry side and uh, give strength to the confidence of uh, Uh, participants to participate actively in our um, in our uh, longer tenor instruments yeah. thanks sarachi so what i had to say yeah. <laughs> very Thank interesting you. i'll come back to rishi on the kind of innovation that they can offer and sri ram yeah, as well really nice. i would i would yeah. like to hear perspectives so, on that so one of the things i must say uh, that you know one of the bonds that has moved the fastest is uh, the chola perp uh, i think from a 10 half 1075 yeah. kind of level so it's hitting close to 9% so i mean that's uh, partly because i think what uh, chola i think has done is uh, the kind of disclosures that it has put out i think that has given uh, a great comfort to uh, you know the investors yeah. and i think uh, some of the other nbfcs haven't been as transparent uh, Uh, as chola has so so lakshmi thanks on that uh, absolutely i think I, rishi that's i told larul uh, also the same thing that uh, you know it's a great great uh, uh, move by you know you know during covid that presentation that you all had put out that's so, fantastic that's actually that means um, it 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 opens your eyes to the fact that uh, in, the information is going to be the key especially the disclosures by the issuers right uh, shriram i think is i think one of the very few uh, yeah. investors who looks so closely at uh, disclosure of information uh, shriram i'll uh, i'll leave it open to you i mean you're managing a huge corpus uh, you have a big problem of liquidity and uh, you you can actually you know uh, i you can actually with your if if your view is on one one kind of an instrument is fine you can actually make a huge market in that itself uh, so uh, give, just uh, we would like to know your thoughts on you know how you are going to handle the whole market at this point of time and where do you see uh, yourself uh, in terms of investing your corpus going forward and um, uh, anything on the disclosure aspect as well i mean which sure. you would particularly look at um, uh, in terms of evaluating structures or issuers credits etc sure uh, arjun uh, you have been a time traveler as well in the market so i guess we don't handle the market and we get mad handled by the market uh, every five years right that's the reality but see if you if you kind of look at uh, indian market structure right 
um as as uh, rishi also kind of highlighted that you know the market is largely institution dominated even in institution domination if you look at it the stock of bonds versus the trading uh, market share is extremely skewed for instance if you look at mutual funds right the aggregate percentage of bonds that they hold they have a lot more velocity if you look at insurance companies they hold about even in government securities if you vaguely remember they have about 20% of government securities that they own but their trading volume contribution is hardly 1%. Compare it to a PD who holds about 1% of government security outstanding and trades for almost about 15% of the market volume. So this skewness uh, just cannot sustain. See, your, your, every five year or four year, your, Bombay mar- your, your bond market comes to resemble like your Bombay suburban peak or traffic, right? You have everybody sitting on one side of the platform and not on the other <laughs> side. Correct. Everybody is either a seller or a buyer. See, retailing in bond market uh, has been attempted in the past. I guess even, uh, I'm sure during your days in ICICI Bank, I think you did uh, make an effort to kind of uh, kickstart retailing in government securities. Uh, even I kind of entered the markets way back in 92, 93 in retailing in bonds. You know, when, when State Bank of India had issued uh, floating rate bonds, uh, the era of fiscal dominance where government used to borrow at 14%. So State Bank of India had... Uh, issued a bond which gives about 3% over a term deposit rate of uh, SBI, maximum TDR of SBI. Right? So we used to kind of retail these bonds to HNIs and then once again aggregate them and sell it to provident funds. See, if you, if, you, if you kind of look back, even a textbook definition of a good bond market is it has to be liquid, it has to be transparent, it has to kind of assure the investor of a settlement once the you know trade is done. Right? Uh, liquidity in bond markets, less said the better. When you have... Even in government securities, you have around um, you know four securities a trade. A single finger, you can count the number of securities a trade for volumes, right? Transparency, I think, uh, in some markets, transparency levels have improved. For instance, in government security, transparency levels have improved. INR bonds definitely tries to you know uh, take that forward in non-government bonds by improving level of transparency. Surety of completion is still a long way away. I don't think we are anywhere closer to a surety of completion in uh, bond markets. So till these three pillars have kind of uh, settled, it's, it's always going to be a big challenge for bond markets to see depth. I mean, in 92, 93, we used to come with the promise that bond markets are very nascent and it will see deeper growth in the next about 10 years. I guess it's, it's been almost about 30 years and we still see that uh, you know, as a hope. So uh, until some of these things get sorted out, it's not going to be a way. And, you look back and Indian markets, one has to be sympathetic about where we started and the journey that we have come through. Indian markets have enormous level of fiscal dominance, right? You have 75% of the total bond market dominated by either government or government owned companies that are borrowing in the market. So till that kind of dominates the bond market, it becomes extremely difficult to see that. And emerging markets like India are always characterized by a certain level of uh, bank dominance in financing. You require savings aggregation largely not happening through market, more by banks. So all these things also kind of confluence to bring us to where we are. At least these are explaining us to where we are. But the way forward is, you know, you don't have a choice but to get the retail investor in because the retail investor is the one who can give you non-correlated investor flows and trades. Right? You can't just look at retail to come in only when you see a 2020 kind of situation or a 2013 kind of taper tantrum to come in and buy. You need to have him all through. And for that, I think the level of transparency in the market has improved. Um, as as uh, Lakshmi also pointed out and as Rishi also kind of pointed out, you need to get uh, the investor to be empowered through information, right? Level of transparency. It has to be easy and made, uh, you know, transparent in a way that he can understand. Investors need to take informed decisions and that's very important. And they need to understand what they're getting into. I mean, in a good market, I guess you can always mistake brains for bull market and probably you know go in uh, all out. But every time when the market turns around, you always have uh, you know patches. You always have those streaks of one bad company. That should not kind of uh, constrain access to capital to you know, vast majority of the company, and that's very very important. Correct. So I guess I guess investors also have to kind of take informed decisions. Uh, your initiative is a very good initiative, but I guess uh, they need to understand these things a lot more. For us, uh, it's, it's been a lot more challenging year uh, as we look at this point of time. Uh, capital always comes in at a time when you uh, when, when asset prices are very expensive, right? So we've got a, a bout of capital recently. 
it's going to be very tough you know we textbooks talk about bond as risk free return uh, i guess now we are at return free risk in fact globally right? in india also rates are very low so uh, a lot of these things are cyclical you know sometimes we use this word called structural very liberally but interest rates are definitely cyclical and we are going through uh, lower end of the cycle so i guess rates are going to head higher uh, so as much as we can buy and hold we can also hold and buy that's what we are trying to trying to kind of uh, kick the can down the road at this point of time right so one common theme i think coming through with all everyone here is that um, the rates are low and uh, they can only move up uh, and that's like uh, that's what uh, even i have brought out in the presentation uh but that brings its own challenges like um sriram was saying uh sriram when do you see yourself actually going longer on the yield curve you have been short yeah we have largely stuck to the short trend see longer on the yield curve any asset prices uh, offer you value only when you kind of uh, you know see that bombay crowd shifting onto the other side uh, you know we were we were one big buyers in in, in chola perpetuals uh, in 2013 right when when chola i was going through some cycle we were one sided single largest buyers at the point of time we kept taking exposures in primary and then in secondary and we kind of cleaned out the market recently so you need to wait for such moments and till the central bankers are completely in charge uh, it's, it's very difficult for us to kind of put a timeline but uh, as as you also kind of highlighted this uh, guard railing that central bankers are standing also kind of exposes the market to a lot of risk because the moment they kind of take their hands off right i guess the market is going to find it too difficult to kind of readjust so it's very easy to assume that yes a central banker is there he'll kind of give us a option to kind of exit it's very easy to assume but the moment that is not there i think the markets are going to readjust so my uh, hunch is that in next 18 months down the line i think we'll be dealing with uh, a lot more inflation than what we forecast because disinflation to a large extent has happened because of base and agri prices coming down agri prices don't impact rbi on its way up so why would it impact on its way down so core is still sticky manufacturing inflation is still sticky so i guess it's it's going to be very difficult for india to ignore those for a while too long so 18 months down the line i think we'll be there to buy as many uh, long bonds so rishi uh, uh, i think we have seen over the last so many years that as yields go up and when rates are more attractive that's when actually uh, the market actually widens much fa- pretty fast right. right so this actually also comes out uh, where we also spoke about the fact that the retailization at the, is going to increase substantially right and uh, the digitization will have to, will be uh, the most important part of retailization of the market right uh, so in that sense uh, what do you think uh, the kind of products that can in a way any innovation that you can think of for example if you want to tell raji what kind of products she can look at to invest do you have any kind of a thought on that so see uh, arjun let me um, answer this in sort of two ways first is that you know uh, structurally if you see the investor segment in the market right uh, barring uh, you know the retail and corporate and stuff like that in the in the institutional side you have very 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 clear uh, sort of demarcation of what certain investors will do right so you have mutual funds would do a 3 to 5 year kind of set and you know only in on a uh, you know very clear indication of uh, trading zones they would come into long or uh, they would stick in uh, gsec you have bankers who are in the past uh, i think uh, Five to seven years only been on uh, uh, like you know buy and hold like a uh, insurance company. So due to the fact that such large investors are predictably behaving in a certain way year on year, uh, there is no innovation in the market. To right. give you an example, today banks have great access to swaps, but a floating rate bond. no one wants to do right, right. Uh, for whatever reason that they have uh, so there are a couple of uh, issues on based on that one is that are they allowed to do it not that they can't do it uh, regulatorily or uh, as per approvals but the fact is no one wants to try a new product that's the big 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 problem 
and i think that is where the first mover advantage uh, sort of uh, firms like azim premji can actually score and get that uh, extra sort of spread on, uh, spread on such papers uh, if you see covered bonds nothing has really moved so far uh, where uh, or even basic rate enhancement nothing seems to have moved largely because the institutional said don't want to take it uh, so if a, if an insurance doesn't want it if a bank doesn't want it if a mutual fund doesn't want it who is going to buy it? even if uh, you know uh, corporates buy it from a prop side there is zero liquidity because there is no one buying it on the other side so uh, you know for for some for someone like chola today i think a great opportunity is in a uh, floating rate bond i think uh, due to the fact that uh, everyone perceives that in, uh, inflation is going to be uh, sort of much higher uh, automatically you know there should be interest on that there are hedging mechanisms for those in case it doesn't move as fast as they think so i think that is one second i think as a concept and we've been trying to push that for very long is uh, actually the concept of a market maker so it could be anyone it could be a bank it could be a corporate uh, uh, it could be uh, you know uh, institutions like us who come in uh, actually start giving two way quotes make the market reprice the bond because uh, it's not uh, currently in in, uh, in in flavor so i think that is something as a policy it needs to be put out that you know market making hey this this is uh, Uh, a market maker and there is a two way quote available and uh, definitely on the longer side all the companies would benefit uh, i would love to do that but at the end of the day someone has to pay for the market making That's because right. uh, mm. uh, you know the the kind of uh, risk taken it's a risk not yes. commensurate yes so i think that plus you know there should be a greater uh, access to uh, sort of liquidity given to uh, non banks as well uh because a market maker should be able to access uh, cheaper money otherwise or get paid for it in some form or the other so i think that is uh, very very important uh right. so uh something like a, a covered bond something like a like i'll give you one small example chola is today a double a plus rated entity there are certain investors who would only and only buy a triple a even if uh chola as a double a plus was far superior than all the triple a's of uh you know three years back so uh, you know uh, and maybe was was paying a much lower price being a double a plus so uh, maybe a simple credit enhancement to a triple a at least get those guys in and uh, you know they end up buying chola and i think the the most important thing is people should get comfortable with the company and uh, likewise the com- uh, uh, the company should also be comfortable in throwing out information we've seen a lot of great information sharing by uh, issuers today i i just hope that continues it's just that it's not accessible in one place and right. if you see any of the platforms uh, it's extremely difficult to find a bond extremely difficult and then further uh, finding information it's you know very very complicated sometimes even we find it so difficult you just leave it you know retail chhod do you know you're getting some 10 20 lakhs at a good rate forget it who's going to you know spend time doing all this there so i think it's uh, it's also important that the retail guys uh, you know as they come in uh, larger herds they can be sort of an agent for change where uh, illiquid bonds where bonds uh, you know which are out of uh, flavor of institutions at that point of time they could come in and be yeah. sort of you know seal the vacuum actually so a uh, very good point rishi and uh, actually uh, it gives us uh, at least in nnr bonds uh, what you have raised is that i mean we are trying to give as much of information but uh, if we can start being the repository of uh, all the uh, highly uh, informative information uh, sorry highly transparent information that issue has put out Mm-hmm. then it's we can be one place where we can, people can access all the information and mm-hmm. then take the decisions yes actually extremely uh, valid point there uh, so now with this um, i think uh, we have covered uh, independent views and thoughts and that's extremely useful i'm sure for the, all the people who have been present here 
uh, i will uh, we can uh, 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 we can leave the floor open to the participants to ask any questions uh, to to me or the panelists uh, now um, so anybody who wants to ask a question can raise your hand or you just chat, put it in the chat box and uh, we can just direct it to the participants or if you want to be unmuted you can also tell ketan he will be unmuted Uh, so we have a question from Vinamra. Uh, I'll unmute you, sir. Hi, question, yeah. Yeah, hi, my name is Vinamra. I'm from Dharashaw. My question is for Shriram. So, Shriram, now uh, we all know this year government borrowed around about 12 lakh crores and probably they're going to carry with this huge borrowing in the coming couple of years as well. So now where do you see government, uh, you know, fixing this thing? You, do you see big bank disinvestments happening? And even on the other side, uh, you know, on the fiscal side also, government cannot afford to raise any corporate tax or even the personal tax rates. So where do you see, you, as per me, it's only disinvestment where government can get money. Do you see any other way where can, government can, you know, get this extra money and then we can get back to a three and a half percent of deficit, fiscal deficit? Yeah, if you if you kind of look at uh, uh, the last time when we hit that sweet spot of three percent fiscal deficit, right? Uh, that happened at a time when we kind of grew faster than what we had anticipated. So democracy is not just uh, in Asia, but globally. Democracies work their way out of fiscal deficit only through growth and not through belt tightening. So, so the first and foremost thing is next year, as as economic survey has outlined, nominal GDP can be at about 15 percent, which I think looks to be very reasonable. A 15 percent nominal GDP growth and corporate profitability coming from a cyclical low, you would see a fairly decent collection in corporate tax rates. I mean, that would be you know one number that can probably you know give you a huge surprise. And indirect taxes largely track nominal GDP growth. So you, you, you shouldn't be surprised if you kind of see a total tax collection of almost about uh, you know, 20 to 23% growth for next financial year. And uh, just keep one thing in mind. A lot of uh, borrowing this year was primarily to fund the uh, non-receipt of taxes, uh, disruptions in taxes that we kept having through the year. Right? Next year, our borrowing by default will be lower than this year. We don't require a, you know, first of all, next year borrowing in any case cannot be, you know, it's, it's, it's not right to assume that uh, though the borrowing program is now set at 12 lakh crores and probably you know, has to go high. So next year borrowing obviously will be at around some 7 lakh crores net. You probably see that we start tapering down. So I don't think uh, it's right to assume uh, this. And the only way we kind of get ourselves out of this uh, rabbit hole is by trying to grow ourselves out. Okay. Um... I have a question here. Uh, uh, I had mentioned that um, uh, GSEC yield is artificially managed by the RBI and this moral hazard to our nation, um, uh, to our nation's economy uh, for long term. Please light on this. And second question is, what is the solution for that? Okay. Now, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, I'm not able to see who the... Uh, okay, this is from... Uh, um, Mustafa uh, Mansuri. Uh, yeah. So, uh, in the, uh, the, the... I'll answer the second question first. I think, like I mentioned, I think RBI should stop uh, targeting yields. If they want to support the government borrowings, they should just buy the government bonds. Now, we had the situation in 2008 when, nine, when the government took up fiscal deficit and the market reacted very badly to that. And RBI stepped in with uh, open market purchases to buy. But what they didn't do was they didn't uh, target yields. So they allowed the market to function normally. Here, what the RBI is doing is they're trying to support the government borrowing as well as they're targeting an yield of 585 to 580 to 6% on the 10-year. Now, which is, not a, which is not an ideal thing to do at all, because that means uh, year on year, if they do it for the, well, even this year, for example, 
then uh, all the savings of the nation is going into bonds through banks or uh, insurance companies or provident funds or even directly from the uh, investors retail investors into corporate bonds that are priced over the government bonds at a managed yield of 580 to 6 and like shriram said once they uh, are just not able to manage that because the inflation is going towards 7 to 8% then uh, you have uh you have the whole curve shifting upwards and there is a huge amount of losses people are staring at right so the first thing they should do is to stop managing the yields they can support the government borrowing we don't have a problem at all with that but they should stop managing the yield let the market determine the yields and yes on the moral hazard side like i said if uh, if you are supporting yields and providing liquidity what uh, what i typically call it is a mispricing of risk by the markets so you had this situation in uh, in, in 1997 to 2000 uh, 2000 when the fed was uh, when the inter- internet bubble broke in 2000 the whole blame was on allen so the fed and greenspan because it was felt that the fed was artificially holding uh, the rates down when it was not supposed to and that led to a huge amount of mispricing of the uh, risk and then we know what happened after that the same thing happened after uh, in the 2004 to 2008 period when the fed just didn't do enough to uh, uh, to protect the market from the excessive risk it was taking and the and we know what happened in 2008 9 right and we know what happened in covid uh, covid was a different factor but the point was the market was so heavily uh, in uh, risk that uh, when it came the covid came the fed had to like buy all kinds of junk it had to buy equities i mean it even threatened to buy equities they still have an option uh, by the way uh, and then every single junk paper they were willing to buy just to protect the market now how long are they going to continue to hold this it's a huge moral hazard because then what what is it what is uh, if i was for example chola is managing their money so well and uh, also they are very very transparent but another nbfc that is not doing as good as chola and not being transparent at all is now being protected by the rbi and uh, they are able to raise money um, just because uh, of the rbi not because of the fact that they have been a good company now so where does this lead to so these are all the moral hazards especially in the mispricing of risk the moral hazard is phenomenally high and uh, so the, the the that's why uh, the losses especially when uh, markets turn unstable unstable can be very very high so that's uh, one of the main issues uh, is what i uh, hear um, is what i meant by the moral hazard concept here uh, so i have a next question here uh, from pradeep sharma what is your view on gold and uh sgb um okay on gold uh my own uh, uh, our own uh, view on inr bonds is that gold prices uh, will rise that's largely because of the huge amount of money supply that is being thrown at in the market and the dollar will continue to tank on sgb i would um, give this question to sriram i think he's talking about sovereign gold bond uh, which sovereign essentially tracks bond. which essentially tracks gold i don't yeah. think uh, yeah so i don't think you're buying things. this are you buying this or no not at uh, no. not at no. okay fine yeah. so if gold prices move up sgb is also attractive yes. but um, we have actually given a very strong uh, uh, innovative solution to sgbs because sgbs are illiquid <laughs> and uh, the rate is 2 and 1/2% so right. we have given a portfolio uh, we call it the goldilocks portfolio um, where we tell people that you invest uh, say for example in a 3 year bond uh, if you can identify a good credit you can anything between 7 to 8% uh, and then uh, uh, the rest in gold so it could be a weight of 50% 50% of 50 60% in bond 40% in gold good. and uh, what typically happens is that um, over a period of 3 years the gold if the gold prices rise uh, so you get a solid uh, return uh, much higher than uh, the your existing fixed income returns and even if the gold prices fall by 25% for example your uh, the cash flow from your uh, the bond bonds will actually protect your capital 
so this is much a much better liquid or liquid option than buying into an SDB, a sovereign gold bond. But the only difference is that SDB is a government issued bond. Obviously, uh, you have to take a little bit of credit risk in this. Whereas the you can even do it through a GSEC, but GSEC is still volatile. But uh, over a three-year period, you get on the gold itself, you get an indexation benefit, etc. So we do have a Goldilocks portfolio. But yes, to your answer your question, the answer is uh, gold prices will move up. Uh, Expectation uh, of higher inflation will kind of push uh, yeah. gold prices. That's what uh, at least I, we uh, we at INR bonds believe. I mean, uh, obviously, other people have, market has different views, uh, which is uh, which is what a market should do. So if I have a view, somebody else should have another view. Uh, we should not have everybody having the same view, right? Uh, fine. Then we have a question from Vikram Dalal. Public issue of PFC got a good response. Um, uh, got a good response as the face value of a bond was of rupees thousand. If we have more of public issues from likes of Chola Mandalam or any other uh, good issuer, then we'll get good response from retail investor. This is both for Rishi and uh, Raji. I think it's a very very good uh, point of view by Vikram. And uh, um, yeah, so uh, Raji, would you have any uh, suggestion? I mean, thought process of going public or doing a public debt issue? I think you're on mute. Uh, yeah. Uh, Can I have the question again, please, Arjun? Sorry. Uh, Raji, do you have any thought process on doing a public debt issue? Public debt issue. Public debt. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'll just read the question out again. Uh, public issue of PFC got a good response as the face value for per bond was rupees thousand. If we have more of public issue from likes of Chola Mandalam and any other good issuer, we'll get good response from retail investors. That's the question. Not it's actually a statement. I don't so know what not... action it will okay. have. Fine. So you've not really thought about it. Uh, Rishi, would you have any answer to that? Yeah. So basically one of the deterrent, yes. So one of the deterrents, Arjun, for uh, public issue by NBFC is, is the uh, sort of higher cost involved, right? And uh, typically, you know, issuers like PFC, etc., cetera, they, uh, they prefer longer issuances rather than the shorter ones. Uh, whereas what we have seen, NBFCs are doing long bonds only and only to capture a price, uh, not from an ALM perspective. So it's the three, five, and two, and you know wherever they see that uh, ALM uh, uh, borrowing and you know the the, the amazing uh, yields on uh, the short bonds, I think that's the uh, sort of uh, one of the reasons. And uh, as the yields move up and the ALM requirement for long bonds is actually there, uh, you know, maybe then NBFCs could come in, but at least my con it's just, you know, there was a tick box, uh, which uh, many of them had to uh, take on that, you know, diversification of funding or whatever. Okay. That was one of the reasons why uh, many of them actually came in. This is post DHFL, post uh, right. ILFS and, things like that where, you know, diversification was important. Today, not so much. So I don't see anyone really coming there. Uh, plus, you know, it's too much of an administrative issue, monthly coupon, quarterly coupon, just all those kind of uh, issues. Uh, no one wants to really get into it. Right. And uh, can I come in here, Arjun? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. See, investors always look for nominal yields. I think the, the real yield uh, is a very good concept to speak for a, a institution, but not for a retail investor. Retail right. investors are still anchored to nominal yields. So, you know, at, at a point of time when the nominal yields are very attractive, you would see a lot more participation. A lot more participation. Correct. Yes, absolutely. I think I buy that point. Uh, so we have from Suyash uh, uh, Joshi, yesterday's economic survey expects inflation to be at 6.6% in next fiscal year. Now that's a high inflation. How do you see such inflation uh, level, which is out of RBI comfort zone from bond market and interest rate? Yes, very clearly. I mean, I think um, uh, even if the survey is expecting, and then uh, if we see uh, inflation at much higher level, 
and i think rbi to some extent is very conscious that uh, they are creating a moral hazard uh they are not openly said so but they have been uh, any talk of changing their inflation uh, targeting they have resisted if you take the recent uh, uh, communications right from the governor so clearly i think they will it will be factored and uh, if if they continue to see inflationary pressures uh what we expect is and we also put out a note actually sometime in the last in january that we could see a rate hike as soon as april uh, uh, uh in the first quarter of this fiscal year uh, uh because if if there is a sense that inflationary pressures can shoot up rather than because see the last time we saw fiscal deficit crossing uh, 6% of gdp uh, in 2008 9 the years of 2010 11 2010 uh, i think 9 and 10 or 10 and 11 uh, was uh, double digit inflations so i don't think they want that uh, in that sense they might want to start to control the whole expectations of uh, lower rates going forward uh again vikram is asking a question state guaranteed papers like uppcl apc rda etc are safe to invest any default history in the past i think krishi is a good uh, krishi i think it's you are the best person here to answer can i come in arjun yeah yeah absolutely see absence of evidence does not necessarily mean evidence of absence so don't don't just look back at history and say okay look it's not happened so hence it will not happen one second is have there been precedences of government guaranteed or state government guaranteed bonds default yes we have had precedences but they have, i mean they have they have defaulted and then gone out to restructure the payment and probably paid ifca has done it in the past hmt has done it ita has done it so so uh, i mean it, it's 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 so much important for investors to kind of uh, uh, make investments in a more informed way and monitor the investments if you look at even rating agencies rating agencies assume certain business conditions as they kind of rate a company business conditions can change yeah, stochastics all these things can change so hence you need to be awake and alive to what investments you are making not just at the point of doing it but also on a concurrent basis till your maturity is done it's like buying a house you don't just do a diligence only at the point of buying a house even at every point of time you keep doing repairs maintain it monitor it that's how you need to do this absolutely i think uh i think that's the best uh, uh, uh point investors can get on state government guaranteed bonds uh personally i always have a discomfort on state government guaranteed bonds largely because the states don't have fiscal discipline discipline the government has fiscal discipline central government has because they are monitored by global uh, 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 global economists right and the market is monitoring them continuously states can get away with this because most of these bonds are taken up by uh, pfs and others right so and even if uh, people let's say for example if an lic goes and invests in a bond of a state it's fine because lic can always arm twist arm twist that state to give the money back whereas a retail investor cannot do that so it's very difficult to take a call so unless you are very very clued on uh, and monitoring that uh, particular investment so even a, for a retail investor even if a default happens and uh, and the the promise that the state will pay back in say uh, next month or year that one month can be a very crucial time for that person so do you want to take that risk for that higher yield you will have to decide yourself um right and they don't they don't kind of they don't kind of earn the money to repay they only keep borrowing to repay yeah yeah absolutely i mean they don't have the money to <laughs> exactly the states don't have money uh, now do the companies to have yeah. money <laughs> yeah so we uh, have so one more thing here arjun is that yes Okay. Sorry. So one more thing on the state is uh, it's uh, also important to see the structure because some of these states, uh, you know, in the past we have done some uh, bonds where we had structured uh, a lot of fixed asset into it. So like a lot of land that was owned by the sort of underlying company, uh, we had like a three x cover and things like that, uh, which you know. Uh, Five six years down was actually six seven x uh, cover because it was just a volume of uh, land. So I 
think that is uh, also something that uh, one has to see. What's the underlying uh, structure? Is, there, is it safe enough? And whether cash flows are there? So besides uh, the state, fair enough. Also, yeah. Yeah, the yeah, only so, challenge about the only challenge about the security uh, issue, uh, Rishi, is that uh, I mean we we, have, we we kind of every every painful experience gives us some new learning. Yes, the course. new learning that we have is that uh, you know enforcement of security cover is not very easy in India, even under IBC. So, true, true. so it, it's very easy that you know companies are taken for liquidation by unsecured creditors, saying that look, you know, secured creditors can look upon it only to the extent of liquidation value. Very so anything true. over liquidation value has to be pro rata. That's how it is. So that's not the way Absolutely. you. Yeah. But very one true. thing, uh, if uh, the states can actually provide more uh, details on the structure, then uh, if we at INR bonds we can actually put out the kind of information. So, so we can take a much better decision on that. Um, when you when you know that something is risky, it's yeah. so much better for you to preempt it than to predict whether there'll be an accident or Absolutely. when there'll be an accident. Yeah. yeah. So actually, yeah, there's an interesting question there. But just before that, um, there is a question from Pritesh that do you feel currency appreciation from here in last one month? We have seen INR from 70p. Uh, currency, yes, as long as the dollar continues to fall, we could see. But uh, I think this can stop if the if the global uh, investors believe that uh, uh, one is uh, uh, globally itself that excess uh, uh, markets are overpriced, and second is if India's fiscal deficit and inflation is going to start rising much faster than anticipated, then uh, you could have an issue there, right? Uh, just let me interject here. Uh, there's something which I wanted to tell uh, everyone uh, for this year's borrowing. Now there are a couple of surprises that can happen. Right, uh, the government has taken approval to go to the uh, global markets for bonds um, last year, I think, but they have not done so. So, if they believe that Indian markets cannot absorb it, they might just go on to a global issuance. Uh, the sec second is they could show some surprises uh, in terms of uh, disinvestment, etc. Uh, and like Sri Ram said, uh, revenue growth could also be shown at a much higher level. So all these three could actually maybe not make fiscal deficit look as bad as it was this year and may not look it as bad as it will appear. But having said that, I still do not see uh, net borrowing below 7 lakh crores. So that itself is a very high number. Here from Aria, where do you see the liquidity in the market going forward? Market will be pretty liquid. Oh, no, for the bond market liquidity, uh, I think the liquidity is down. So what we need to see for the bond market, especially for the government security market, is to RBI to lay off. Once RBI lays off, the liquidity will improve. Because uh, we have seen liquidity come off from daily volumes come off from uh, 800 billion to 200 billion. And 200 billion, especially when uh, government is issuing bonds um, left, right and center. So as more supply comes in, liquidity is not there. Clearly, there is no way yields can be held. And only RBI is holding the market. So once they let the market go, liquidity should start improving. But uh, the, normally the global, uh, normally the domestic system liquidity will be very high. RBI will not, uh, they will only try to suck out liquidity slowly, uh, but uh, not very fast in that sense. So they'll keep liquidity at a very high level in that, uh, in that. And so if you really want to know, if they want to raise repo rates, uh, everything, the curves will start to track the repo rate and will not go really ahead of the curve. Now, this question is from Sunil Alba. So after the DHFL, ILFS fiasco, should retail investors still depend on rating agencies or AA or the, uh, of label or, or are there other early warnings mechanism? This is, I think, a question which both Sriram and Rishi, uh, Rishi had answered. Uh, clearly, no. Uh, I think... Uh, I mean, it's not it's not the rocket science to say a PSU bond is to play because the government is, will will pay the money back. But a state government bond, it is rocket science because you don't know whether the state will pay the money back for the guaranteed bond. Uh, whether uh, then you then you would have an NBFC that is rated triple A because they have two x leverage. Then suddenly next year you will find that they are eight x leverage. Then what? Where is the triple A there? Right. So that is what happened in the case of DHFL. The rating agencies didn't see that leverage coming and they continue to ignore that. And suddenly they found that uh, they were raising money at AAA levels, but spending like an A plus company or A company. 
and uh, then the whole thing collapsed right so most important is to have a watch on what the market is saying second and also uh, uh, like in places where inr bonds where we have got a credit spread score i think it's a very very strong uh, uh, it's a very strong uh, uh, indicator to watch out for when we say a bond is high risk it doesn't mean that the bond will default or anything it's just meaning meaning that you are getting into these yields because of the higher risk nature of the particular issuer or the issuer itself is facing a higher risk for various issues right uh, so this is from vittal vittal is from inr bonds um sriram this is for you uh, yeah um you mentioned about three pillars for an efficient market uh, and what has uh, what we have seen from last 30 years actually we see rbi and mrf setting up uh, uh, various committees and giving statements but still we don't see much of developments what is behind this uh, comment from comment on intention of rbi mrf issuers and uh, intermediaries would uh, like yeah, to sure. hear Come yeah definitely this from both sri ram sure. and rishi yeah sure see uh, while while initiatives it's, it's not that things have been very bad over the last 30 years i'm sure there have been lot of improvements uh, in government securities we have actually moved over to real time settlement so i guess this complete transparency and uh, this but liquidity angle will come in only when the structure of indian market changes so if you ask me uh, the, the the premise of indian market is you have you have banks which are on top of the food chain then you have RBI, insurance companies, provident funds, and then am I missing anything? PFRDA, and then uh, you have mutual funds, right? Uh, and primary dealers. They comprise the entire market. And if you look at it, the top three, four guys would have almost about sixty percent or seventy percent of the stock of holding in government securities. So, by mutual funds trying to kind of uh, trade in the market, it's like tail trying to wag the dog. Price setting is happening by a very small fringe players in the market. and setting the price for the head which is not uh, possible so in fact there have been lot of recommendations also within sibi and rbi there have been discussion papers which are posted they are trying to make it obligatory on the part of uh, institutions with large stocks of bonds to come and trade in the market at least for a certain percentage of their holding so that the market becomes more liquid the only way this market can become more liquid is as i said you need to have non correlated investor segments come into the market so which can only happen because you know if you look at this uh, insurance companies banks mutual funds all of them are connected uh, players in the market because you know information dissemination happens very very fast in this market i'm sure you know the moment a particular view gets shaped in the market uh, there would not be any uh, you know second information dissemination that comes to even uh, lakshmi's desk so i'm sure all of us are pretty much connected in the market as what it happens which means you know there's no other cushioning factor in the market that can happen only when you have other segments of markets come in yes for absolutely. instance pfrda right provident funds can also become more active in secondary market you need to have retail investors that's the only solution to this market right. you need to have a bit hopefully i think a few more years down the line or a decade down the line when pfrda becomes a very large institution and probably has a lot more depth of investment then probably you might see the market to be slightly more liquid they can buy when the rest of us are standing on one side of the bombay traffic platform right. correct uh one more factor i would like to add in this um in the last 20 years we have not seen the move towards digitization as we are seeing now right um uh, just to give you a perspective on a global sense uh, digital bond platforms uh, in uh, in the last few years the last 6 years have uh, grown substantially i think in in europe and europe it's uh, europe and us about 100 plus digital platforms have come and many of them are doing excellent volumes um so a digitization of bonds is going to be the key towards retail uh, non institutional participants coming in and uh, yeah so uh, at inr bond we completely believe we are at the forefront of the bond digitization process and uh, we hope that uh, digitization itself can make the bond market that much more depth and vibrant uh, going forward and uh, yeah we will continue to stick to this whole digitization theme of us uh, and uh, improve it on a day by day basis uh, going forward uh, i'm just uh, getting this question from hyder 
uh, which is a very important question. Mutual fund investors, investment perspective, is, um, is it fair to put all money in floating rate funds right now as yields are only expected to rise from next three years and move out completely from duration, other accrual products, your views. Um, floating rate funds, yes, I mean, it makes good sense, but the biggest problem with floating rate funds, as I see it now, is the lack of instruments they have to invest. So the best, uh, there are two ways to look at it. Now, the best floating rate fund you can have is to have uh, put your money into a say six months or a one year fund and then uh, reinvest that money later uh, into uh, higher yielding duration funds uh, after one six months or one year if rates move up right so you can manage your own floating rate fund now if you would need to see what kind of papers and mutual funds are buying uh, into the floating rate funds because uh, floating rate uh, papers are just not there in the market so what are they buying uh, if they are actually buying fixed and going into swaps on a floating rate basis, what are the costs they're paying? Uh, what is the cost of the swap? Because swap spreads are pretty high, especially for large volumes, and you don't do it much. Uh, can you short the? Can you buy a ten-year bond and short the IRF? Um, can you buy, a, for example, a ten-year corporate bond at a spread and short the interest rate and make it a floating rate, or just the spread play? Yes, possible, but interest rate futures uh, volumes are still pretty low and not enough to fund uh, very large uh, corpuses of funds. So the, there is a challenge. Uh, the, the floating rate fund concept itself is very nice, but there is a huge amount of challenge in managing these funds. And typically, the expectations may not be as good as what you, continue, what you might want to believe in. Uh, Top so market the, has even lesser players than uh, bond markets, yes. Arjun. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So with that, I think, uh, like I said, you can invest in floating rate funds, but you can also do your own floating rate product if you require. Right. Uh, so we have from Sunil Alva, the yeah, same question on DHFI. Even if there are early warning mechanisms like three, there is no exit for retail investors. Very, very important. Yes, there is no exit. And uh, so what you need to do is at the time of investment itself, you need to know whether do you want to invest in such kind of papers or uh, what would be the case if there is a kind of a credit event, where would you be an exit? If you can't find an answer to that, best to stay away from this such kind of a uh, issuance. Um, Don't predict preempt. <laughs> preempt, absolutely. Like, uh, the preempt. Uh, so it's always Arjun, better to Arjun, be all... yeah. Sorry. Carry on, Sri. Go on, go on. Sorry. I, I, I'll, fin I'll start after you. Uh, no, no, no. Like, I mean, I always believe uh, as a fund manager or anything that it's better to uh, leave out one percentage on the table than take extra risk of 5%. Right? I don't need that. Um, which is what Sri Ram also says. Yeah, sorry, Rishi. Sorry. Yeah. So basically what has happened is that, uh, you know, uh, no one wants to sell anything at a loss. So there were investors in SREI there were opportunities to get out, even at a loss. Uh, but at that point of time, no one wanted to do it because interest are high. So why, uh, you know, sort of book a loss? Similarly, there have been opportunities. People have exited uh, from, uh, you know, an, an ECL or a kind of ECL finance kind of papers to even DHFL, etc. Uh, when bonds were sort of being purchased at that 50, 60% uh, types as well. So it's just that, again, that information that, you know, whether I should exit it or not, uh, that is uh, also something in uh, sort of, you know. Yeah, that's very important. It's just right? not there. Absolutely. I think that's a very important uh, point. Um, exit right. is, yeah, even at a cost, exit is a very important factor. If you get yes. an exit, then you need to exit. Right. Uh, just coming down to a few more questions. Uh, let's make this the last few questions as I think we've already crossed one, uh, one hour and 40 minutes. Um, and I think that all of us will have to go for lunch and the panelists also should be uh, you know, carrying on with the day. Uh, I will just, uh, Vikram, in light of resolution of DHFL, how do we differentiate between secured and unsecured instruments? My view on secured and unsecured, and Sriram, correct me if I'm wrong, is that it doesn't matter as long as you know where the cash flows are coming from, because you, you, the instrument can be secured, 
and uh, by the time the company defaults and you get your whatever two paisa back from 100 rupees it will be 10 years so it doesn't make any sense on secured or unsecured what most what is most important is how are you going to get your money back and uh, the best best uh, the most uh, uh, what is it called uh, the safest bond would always be the bond that is uh, generating enough cash flows on a continuous basis and does not see any disruptions going forward the ne- the obviously otherwise the bonds that are guaranteed by the central government of india uh, or the ga- bonds issued by the central government of india and uh, bonds or uh, private sector bonds obviously companies like chola or uh, who have a transparency is extremely high and you know absolutely sure where you're going to get the money from and you know that the management is not going to do anything funny uh, so here i would like to actually introduce the concept of esg on bonds so if you can have an esg uh, view on bonds and you know the whole world is moving towards esg in terms of investments um there is a, there is no shouldn't there shouldn't be any difference between esg on equities and esg on bonds so if you can just see where the where you are going to get the money from i think it's the most important part rather than the security and just to give you a perspective uh, to a large extent rating agencies don't look at security for rating right so um yeah so uh, yeah, i just want to add a point here arjun yeah um, as an issuer i want to say you know like i was mentioning when i spoke earlier that uh, cp cps are attractive for us right now and uh, we are inching towards high percentage levels that uh, was hitherto not seen in chola but you must see something like bajaj for instance almost 60% of their book is unsecured because they have an asset which is uh, you know the consumer durable finance it's a short duration thing they are leveraging on the current scenario by you know going very heavy on um, uh, unsecured uh, cps so uh, as you rightly said um it's uh, and people are lapping it up investors are lapping it up so it's about uh, i think rating agencies um, i mean while they give a broad indication uh, one can't really go by it when one writes out a check to make an investment i think the investor should keep that in mind absolutely so we have a question from uh, parthi uh, sir after your uh, yes bank fiasco perpetual bond issue people are um, are away from perps some time again retail and corporate started coming into it still is it safe on liquidity or still people are miss 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 selling based on high yield okay this i would leave uh, rishi and sriram to answer so uh, can i go at it first uh, rishi yeah yeah yes please yes please see a uh, lot of times you know people were very uncharitable uh, about the way s bank fiasco was handled uh, let me tell you uh, forget rating agencies how many people really read the terms of Uh, perpetual bond a perpetual bond issued by a bank right has the ability to completely impair your principal even without an impairment of equity right so that that's the way the bank uh, perpetuals are structured under certain conditions right the bank can completely write off the perpetual bond without actually impairing equity of the bond right so that's the way the terms of the structure are i don't know how could investors even write checks on these terms you know i'm i'm pretty much the same with even uh, you know ish- perpetuals of banks issued by better quality banks you need to know you are effectively taking an equity risk for a fixed income return when it comes to these instruments corporate perpetuals are very different you know some extent some of them might be cumulative whereas in a case of a bank you have this clause onerous clause called point of non viability which means if that gets triggered Reserve Bank of India, Sumoto can decide to write off the entire bond without paying you a penny, even as the bank does not go into liquidation. So sometimes I think even the most informed investors don't seem to read these clauses, which are part of the term sheet. Forget fine prints. Okay, right. okay just to be, before Rishi answers, uh, at INR right. bonds, in I think when the perpetual started, we put out a very very informative note, especially we covered the Bank of India and uh, we uh, highlighted the risk of the bond. Okay. so now even if you think bank of india will pay back how do you price the call correct ha that, that's a very that's a very it. very good uh, point arjun and the bonds are trading it, yeah. correct when institutional right. investors do that because they know and they know where they cannot price it then i have a problem the second is obviously we we highlighted the risk of the bond because it can default uh, even if bank of india can be paid by the government look at deutsche bank right, right. at one point of time deutsche bank was a global leader then the market turned it to junk it turned it into a junk bond because deutsche bank was uh, almost turned into a failure 
Okay, so the perpetuals got hit so badly, uh, people were actually expecting Deutsche Bank to start defaulting on perpetuals. So anything can happen in perpetuals. We put out uh, and we continue to cover perpetuals in a very wide range in the sense of risk of the perpetuals. Uh, if if you understand the risk and the bond you're getting into, then fine, fair enough, the perpetuals are okay. But if you don't, then uh, better not to do that. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry, Rishi, you can carry on. So one of the thing is, I I think you know the chase for yields. Uh, and there are certain uh, investors who are very clear that you know this kind of money i'm uh, i'm happy if i get 100% and uh, up to 50% i'm ready to take a hit as long as i'm getting a much higher return so there are certain investors like that but yes in the initial period no one really high- highlighted that uh, uh, these are the terms of the bank perpetuals please go through it and uh, you know uh, if you understand it you do it so a lot of times like uh, you know it was just like a name selling uh, and people were investing based on a name especially where the public sector uh, sort of a, you know additional tier ones were concerned uh, be it uh, state bank bank of baroda etc good bank good rating everything but the fact is this information and what it can do that was completely missing so to give you an example when the nbfc perpetual guidelines had first come we actually spent a lot of time going through uh, what happens uh, you know what's been the experience globally on perpetuals so we compared a lot of those notes and then we sort of figured out that you know uh, though the risk is definitely there but uh, one also has to look at uh, who you have invested in and uh, that that should be tracked as well because there are certain points where uh, sort of things happen and uh, so you know we put that into practice uh, in the various structures that we have seen uh, thus far uh, you know how to sort of uh, reduce that po- possible risk and uh, nbfc perpetuals are definitely better than the bank ones in terms of uh, you know the, the risk of uh, non payment in case of uh, you know poor uh, financials of the bank Absolutely. It will not even be deemed as a default, Arjun. Non-payment of interest in yes, a bank yes. perpetual is not yes. even deemed as a default. It's not deemed as a default. It's not deemed as a default. Correct. Yes. Um, okay, now last two questions. Uh, there's one question from Hardik, which I'll give it to Sri Ram and uh, Rishi at the last. I'll just answer a couple of questions before that. We have seen large flows in ETF, but if GSEC supply is more and uh, a scenario where yields goes up, do you see redemption pressures increase in triple a corporate spread over 5 years uh, yes because of the money flowing into bharat bond the psu uh, index uh, triple a has collapsed right the spread is very low 3 year uh, 3 year 5 year and 10 year 10 year is slightly okay uh, still but still the spread is pretty low and uh, if yields tend to move up then if these uh, etfs is outflows then the spreads can move up definitely yes uh, uh, PSU spreads can move up from very low levels uh, from here. Uh, the second question is from Nishant uh, Garavat. Do you see operating rate moving towards repo rate in this calendar year? If uh, then, okay, so the operating rate is the repo rate, right? Uh, is the, so do we see uh, the operating rate uh, is the uh, 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 reverse repo rate? So if you see the operating rate, um, uh, no, what I'm saying. Yeah, it is the call money rate, overnight call money rate. So that is closer to the reverse repo rate. Now, I think we'll say continue, continues to stay towards the reverse repo rate largely because liquidity will be very, very comfortable in the system. I don't see RBA tightening liquidity unless liquidity is tightened uh, automatically from uh, flows out, capital flows out. And so that could mean that uh, the operating rate could move up closer to the uh, towards the repo rate uh, rather than the reverse repo rate. And also a good indicator of this is the one-year OIS, which is still at around 3.5% levels. So at the worst, I don't, th- I don't see too much of an issue. If the w- one-year OIS starts to move over the repo rate, then, uh, then, you, would be, uh, then you would have uh, to answer this question of whether uh, the overnight money can tighten from uh, here on. Uh, so coming to, uh, this is Hardik from Shola. 
this is question for Sri Ram and uh, Rishi. How do we expect the bond markets to deepen? We have regulations where wherein companies cannot invest in papers below AAA, AA. EPFO has been barred from investing in private papers. MFs don't go below AA plus maximum in practice. So it leaves the entire market with a handful of investors and a handful of issuers. So the reliance of bank funding or 90% of the companies looking um, looks imminent. How can this be handled? The second question from Hardik. Um, how do we expect the bond market? Oh, sorry. Is this, okay, the same question. Sorry. Okay. Can I go to? So, yep. This is from Shriram. So, so, uh, so far as uh, uh, question is concerned, it's, it's very relevant. Uh, market is very thin. See, mutual funds today dominate almost about 57% of secondary market volume in bond markets. Right? And Arjun, you have been a mutual fund manager yourself for a very long time, quite good at it. Uh, the challenge that you always have is you become a handcuffed to followers to what the investor wants you to do. Right? Very often, you might want to generate higher returns by probably looking at something which is AA minus. But then I don't know how much of a flexibility you actually would have. You no, need to take a few. call. Yes. Correct. You need to take a call. Should I maximize return by 10, 15 basis point or, uh, you know, will I, will it cost me 10, 15 percent of the AUM? So that's the very tricky call that as a fund manager, you need to keep taking. So, so the larger point that uh, it comes, Hardik, is uh, the fact that investors who are investing are not informed. Uh, bulk of the investors in mutual funds, if you look at it, 87 percent of the fixed income AUM comprises of institutions, banks, large corporates, and to some extent, HNIs. Okay? Even HNIs are people, I wouldn't say they are very informed. They act through aggregators or advisors. So which essentially means a large part of people who probably are investing money are, are investing through an agency relationship or a trustee relationship of some employee handling their money. And uh, which essentially means if I'm handling somebody else's money, I would chicken out at the first uh, sight of a risk or first sense of a risk. So which essentially means fund managers don't have the flexibility to kind of buy the papers that they want to buy to generate higher returns, primarily because the investors standing behind them try to kind of maneuver them to say, look, I don't, I'm not comfortable with this paper. I'm not comfortable with that paper. So Arjun has to keep validating or explaining to the investor saying, no, no, you don't think this is not too risky. So it's, sometimes funds take a very easy route of trying to say, look, I don't want all this headache. So that's one easier way. Uh, will provident funds be allowed to invest in AA? I think a lot of these things are about how much of infrastructure that uh, companies managing provident funds have. Uh, I don't know. I mean, Darasha would be able to validate this much better. Uh, right. 30 years back or 20 years back when I used to deal with provident fund investment job would be dedicated to somebody who's largely handling payrolls. It may not be a chartered accountant, may not be a professional, but somebody who probably be, be, be kind of putting up a note and just kind of closing out transaction. So if that is the kind of infrastructure that companies want to put in, it's very difficult for you to kind of give a trading leeway to such people. Absolutely. Uh, so that's also another challenge. Absolutely. So, uh, okay. I have a point here. Can I uh, ask you, how did Franklin Templeton uh, manage to do what it did? That fund manager went, uh, I mean, he on an oblique path, I guess. So he was probably different, an outlier. And landed everyone in trouble also. <laughs> so, I mean, I suppose um, he took a, it was going well, valued did. And then um, that's probably there. We shouldn't be taking specific examples, but uh, this since was a case of, that came to Since me. you kind of brought up, uh, Lakshmi, the problem which you always have with companies is companies don't default because of net worth erosions. They always default when liquidity erosions happen. Right? Yeah, true. Even in Franklin Templeton's case, it is all a liquidity erosion that happened. I mean, I don't think investors kind of pulled out. I mean, he had he has had one bout of instance in the past in JSPL, right? Uh, I don't think yeah, it yeah. really brought his head down or things turned around 180 degrees. That's not the way it happened. But this time, what happened was we we had a you know I, I don't have the numbers offhand, but I've never seen this level of liquidity erosion in fund markets uh, in such a short period of time. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, right. I mean, right. he is someone who probably, you know, received inflow even after ILFS instance because, you know, he didn't have exposure to ILFS yeah. or yes. ITNL. So, which is very unusual for a credit fund not to have exposure there. So, hence, he kind of got yeah. inflow after ILFS instance. So, maybe that true, true. made him feel that this may not happen. But then, 
you know once this pandemic kind of hit and the kind of liquidity erosion happened that's when the boat dropped i guess yes, yeah yes. so uh, before uh, you close i just want to say one thing um on a question that was raised earlier so tell me when i can talk yeah Uh, Rishi, you want to answer Hardik? Yeah, and then yeah, Rajik yeah. Can... So, uh, so essentially, uh, uh, answering Hardik. See, one of the things is that uh, hopefully by now, I would have thought that uh, banks would be interested in investing in papers, but uh, you know, unfortunately, that situation hasn't changed much. If you see uh, the liquidity erosion post uh, pandemic. uh all the nbfcs were available at mouth watering levels right so i went to a lot of banks and i told them instead of lending money at 8 why don't you just buy the paper at 10 same maturity secured etc uh, not from any other reason but at least if you start buying and if there are 10 other banks buying it won't be available at 10 it will come to say 8 and a half right so one you've made money on that uh, rate and maybe you exit there and if you have lending obligations you do it none of them have listened and they started lending 8 7 whatever as the rates and their plrs move so one is that that kind of uh, you know accountability and that market watch is just not there and uh, so you know leaving aside banks if you see uh insurance companies and provident funds post ilfs dhfl no one wants to take any risk and at the end of the day the fund manager also has to listen to the credit guy which is separated so if the credit guy just doesn't want to take a risk so what do you do so there was this instance uh, recently that between a a, a one year secured and an unsecured uh some mutual funds have a limit for secured but they don't have a uh, sort of limit for unsecured even though the price differential is like 50 60 basis points so you know that just goes to show the risk averseness uh, on a good company it still prevails uh, and these are people who understand credits and uh, you know they they look at uh, this thing day in and day out so one is that uh, it's a risk averseness i think which uh, hopefully in the next uh, year or 18 months as the economy really shapes up and corporate performance increases i think that would lead to uh, lowering uh, sort of this threshold of double a which the insurance and uh, uh, the uh, provident funds have but how many will actually invest i have no idea Well, that's the other uh, sort of uh, annual in the cage, you know. Uh, getting them to do it. One thing that can uh, change, I think, which is already seeing, is a lot more private um, firm managers coming up, AIFs and uh, right, uh, PMSs. True. If uh, if they start, I mean, which is a very good sign because you know, these are the guys who will take uh, they take their own risk, which they believe, not what the investor believes, because they'll go to the investor right. and tell them this is the risk we are taking if you want to invest the money. and right. the investor will uh, uh, typically in such uh, kind of a product the investor goes with a lot of knowledge right right so in that sense they can actually add a lot of value to the bond market uh, then right. uh, give a lot more structures in place lot more issuers lot more uh, sure, sure. Uh, vibrancy to the market uh, i think sure. they should be encouraged sure. uh, much more uh, yes uh, i think uh, one of the biggest changes global changes i mean right now hedge funds are like in the dog house because of retail investors but uh, globally what's changed is that hedge funds did provide a lot of liquidity to a uh, various amount of structures obviously in the lot of bad name as well but having said that they did provide access to funding that's one yeah so uh, raji i'll just leave it to you uh, for, for your last comments because we, i think we are almost done and um, yeah we almost went two hours so yeah So yeah, Arjun, I just want to answer that one question. I know I gave a brief answer, and Rishi explained in great detail. So for this public issue that uh, uh, is an option, an alternate, I just said there's no traction. I might have sounded negative. I just wanted to correct my stance. Uh, we are always open to it. But as Rishi said, you know the 
costs and the time involved in it, the arranger fee, the the market conditions also may change by the time we finish the issue. So these are things that uh, you know uh, put it to a lot of risk. So that's the only reason. Chola is always open to uh, considering it when the timing is right. So I just thought I'll make that stance clear. Fair enough. Okay. Uh, yeah. Point taken. Uh, so I thank uh, thank everyone, especially um, all the participants who have been with us almost two hours now, and a uh, lot of interaction with the panelists. And I especially thank the panelists for uh, you know coming in and spending a Saturday morning uh, two hours. Uh, on bonds, uh, bonds is not the most, uh, what is it called, uh, interesting topic in the world <laughs> at any point of time. Uh, but spending two hours uh, on, on a bond market is, uh, perspectives is very uh, helpful. And uh, yeah, so I mean, a special thanks to all the panelists. Uh, so thank you all uh, uh, for um, joining in. Uh, and uh, we continue to look forward to your interaction and uh, your uh, uh, Please do keep on using INR bonds for whatever all the uh, fixed income requirements that you may have. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sushil. 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 Thanks,